Happy Thursday. I'm Jade Scott. This is Growth RX, and we are live at lunch today with the amazing Heath Williams from Principal Four Osteopathy, owner and founder, and also from Corporate Work Health Australia. He is the go to guy for everything ergonomics, workplace injuries, of health and safety, and we're very lucky to have him joining us today. Welcome, Heath. Thanks for having me along, Jade. I'm um, looking forward to the next 45 minutes. So we should be, well, basically I've got you here today to have a chat with everything going on in mind at the moment with people now working from home more than ever. We've got the COVID restrictions that have hit us. But before we go into those finer details and the important reasons why everyone's joining us today is I want to know a little bit more about you. So we've got three hard-hitting questions to start. Let's start with what's your favourite chocolate bar? Uh, Mars bar. Okay, good one. Good. Yeah. What about if you could have a superpower, what would it be? Ooh, um, I reckon fly. Okay, fly, good. Good, yeah. I've heard that one before. And what about, what do you share my loathe for Crocs, the footwear? Yes, I'm not a massive Crocs fan. Um, however, there will be a time and a place for certain individuals to wear them. Great, and obviously in true Growth RX style, we like to showcase the amazing leadership of others, and I would like to know what leadership means to you. Okay, so, yeah, leadership, I suppose, leadership is doing and trying to, um, I suppose, demonstrate if you've got a team underneath you, you want to be leading and doing so that they can observe how that practice is, um, but also, as a um, as a thing, I would also often really foster um, growth and development in the people that I work with within, within my team, and for them to follow their interests, follow their pathway of where they want to go. So, so lead and do as a leader, but also foster that ability for those people to want to grow through that process themselves. So that's that's my sort of key purpose when it comes to leadership and working with them. Absolutely, and you are certainly leading the way in workplace assessment how did you get into this industry i mean you started off as an osteopath and obviously a passionate practitioner but you've, yep. you've sidestepped across and somewhat specialized in this you run online courses which are heavily sought after what what triggered your interest uh it was just chance actually so i moved to the uk as an osteopath um, and i had to wait a period of time to register to become a, a clinical practice osteopath and during that time i worked for a, a an op health and safety business that focused on these areas. So it was by chance that I got that uh, introduction. And then within that space there, saw the opportunity and going out to the workplace and liaising with individuals and that sort of stuff, I could see that for many circumstances, we could actually truly provide a treatment and management approach that's getting to the cause of some of these issues for them rather than sort of in the treatment room. And so that's what sparked that interest. Um, and then sort of since returning to uh, Melbourne, um, seeing that there's an opportunity here within Melbourne and uh, seeing the benefits of that can bring, I wanted to really sort of focus that alongside my clinical practice. And you've obviously got a wealth of information online through your courses, but today in particular, you we were lucky enough to have you for professional development at Western Region Health with my team. And we wanted to look a little bit more closely at how we can help those patients of ours that all of a sudden have moved from their possibly beautifully set up office space that accommodates with a lovely chair and lumbar support and beautiful desk height and all those sorts of things and have been thrown into a situation where they're potentially working from now their kitchen table. And my team certainly felt that really valuable. So we had a chat about bringing some of that information to here and hopefully helping some other practitioners uh, you know, communicate this a little bit better with their patients when they are in an environment that is prone to more injuries occurring, would you say? Uh, I'd probably say, um, yeah, certainly the environment that they're going to be working in might drive certain risk factors for them to develop aches and pains. But then we're also seeing a big change in how a person operates within their job role, um, given that we're now not having these meetings and face-to-face -face stuff. So that's actually changing the nature of their job. So we need to be mindful of that too. And so often lots of our discussions with both our clients and then other practitioners is around how do we select the best work environment, but then also what do we need to be mindful of and how do we best accommodate ourselves 
when our job role has now changed because of the need to change this as a result of working from home in isolation. And I'm thrilled that you've put together some slides to help kind of go through that. So I'm gonna hand over to you now to do what you do best. Thanks for that. I'm just gonna share the screen here, guys, and then I'm gonna pull up the slide. So just a bit of a preamble. Um, this presentation, the goal here is to, it might be a refresher for many of you, but if there's one or two key points of information, it might be new to you guys as something to think about that you might have as a, a discussion with your clients if you're seeing them in clinical practice or if you're doing telehealth consultations. Just a few things to think about there that might have a, a better outcome for that person if they are working from home. Um, and Jade's going to sort of let me know if there's any questions that come up throughout the presentation and then I'll try and answer them on the fly as we go through if it's um, related to the topic we're talking about. Um, so, I'm going to bring this up. Okay, won't be long. Okay, now, can everyone see that okay? Jade, you've got that okay? Uh, I can't see it on my end just yet. Yep. Uh, there we go. Good to go. Perfect. All right. Um, oh, no. So, there we go. Great. Excellent. Okay. So our goal as practitioners, we've got roles of obviously um, helping you identify potential issues, um, helping problem solve potential issues, helping them better manage musculoskeletal aches and pain. So from this discussion today, I'm hopefully going to give you a couple of key points around those three areas. So what are we going to talk about today? Working from home, what are some of the key challenges? How do we actually educate our client to better select or select a better work environment? We'll go through a very quick step-by-step -step workstation setup guide. That's going to be everything from your dining room table all the way through to the workstation. And then what do we need to understand uh, and what do we need to focus on if it comes to educating our clients? So, for many of you guys, probably like myself, you're dealing with workers now that are in isolation. Um, you've got different stress points. Uh, they've either, they're maybe not moving as much. They've maybe got aspects of uh, mental health and well-being being impacted by this working from home. So we need to be thinking big picture, holistic, biopsychosocial approach, okay? Um, so when it comes to working from home, what are the challenges? So as you've probably picked up with, many of these individuals are now, their job role has totally changed. So um, we're now moving from potentially workers who might used to spend 50% of their time at the desk now spending 100% of the time at their desk because everything is related to the computer and there might be very limited opportunity to get up and move around. Lots of people might be working in a studio apartment or have a two or three bedroom house where they've got a designated office area. So we need to consider where that person fits in on that spectrum. So do they have an appropriate workspace? And then what equipment do they have? And this will differ greatly uh, when it comes to what business that they work for is providing them. So number one thing uh, in Australia anyway, every workplace has a duty of care to their workers and that involves obviously a risk assessment process where they need to identify and manage risks and that would be also providing appropriate tools and equipment for that individual. So sometimes the focus for me might be educating my patient about, well, what's your workplace doing for you? So that might be a discussion that you might want to have with them so that they can then maybe try some change to maybe get themselves access to a chair or an external monitor, etc. Work hours have changed. So some individuals are now working longer hours because they're now not working as efficiently because they're not in the office. Therefore, we need to think about sedentary behaviours and often that they're in for long periods of time and then awkward uh, work activities that are being undertaken repetitively versus others might be having to adjust their work because they've got kids in school drop off and this sort of stuff. So how does that interfere uh, or you know, impact their life? So we need to be thinking about all those big things. Our big challenges. So working in isolation, there'll be certain individuals that are probably um, really enjoying this at the moment, um, yet there's probably going to be others that are potentially um, experiencing this sort of feeling of isolation personally and taking away that social aspect. Obviously, the rules are different in each country and place that we're in, but now that we're sort of integrating into a much more sort of an ability to interact with others, it, we're probably finding that's probably less of an issue. But still, you want to check in with your clients just to make sure do they have a process where they can communicate with their line manager and team members to touch base so that everything's going okay. Um, Obviously, uh, communication strategies differ. So 
for some individuals, um, looking at their, their uh, picture on the screen like we are right now can be quite uncomfortable if they're doing lots of Zoom chats and that sort of stuff. So that can drive uh, people being uncomfortable and that sort of thing. So we need to be thinking about, well, how does this sort of impact them on a bigger picture? And then probably the other key one is how do we separate work and home life? So some individuals now uh, in a one-bedroom studio, everything's in the one space. So therefore, they take on a lot more work stress and that sort of stuff. So we need to be thinking about that and having a chat with our clients from a holistic approach to how we can sort of help with that separation there. And then obviously that support network or social network, how do we support them and encourage them to be sort of tapping into those things um, so that overall they're feeling better from a mental health and wellbeing perspective. So there's going to be lots of challenges that we're going to be dealing with. And you're probably seeing this with all your clients and some will be impacted more by some of these factors and then others are probably totally enjoying being at home. Now, I wanted to highlight this because when we think about risk factors for office or workstation setup, there's lots of it. Typically, we focus on awkward postures, static postures, so anything longer than 30 minutes, duration, doing the same task repetitively for more than two hours, repetitious uh, movements, doing the same task repetitively, how's that working on structures through the body, and then force of movements, hitting the keys hard, etc. So we always think about those biomechanical driven risk factors. However, we also need to think about some of the environmental risk factors, so temperature, lighting, how do they influence and have an impact on a person's wellbeing. And then we want to think more about some of those organisational or uh, cognitive um, factors, such as a lack of influence or control over one's job, pressure to get a job done, how does that drive stress and tension, Communication, how does that work within the business, uh, within team members, etc.? Does that drive someone to behaviour to feel good about themselves or does that actually impact how they feel? So therefore impacts on work productivity, how they're sitting at their workstation, etc. So when we think about a person and risk factors, think cognitive, organisational, but also think about some of those key physical things that us as Health practitioners typically often really focus on is that biomechanical stuff, but knowing that these other factors are just as equal as important, and often it's a multi approach to. Them. So when I'm chatting with all my clients, I'm talking about all these things with them, so I've got a sense about what might be some of the drivers for why they're coming to see me in clinic with aches and pains, and what can I do from as a practitioner, be it as a supporting role or an educating sort of role or a motivating uh, role to help try and drive some change there. So how do we create or find a suitable workspace? This is going to be largely driven by what your house looks like. And so if you're in a single studio apartment, it is what it is. It's going to be in that same space. However, we need to then think about job tasks and how can we separate ourselves from that environment to be able to do some of our job tasks. And that might mean getting outside for phone calls. Um, it might mean when uh, cafes and things like this open up a bit more, how do we, in a socially responsible way, still get out of the house and go and do some of these work tasks just to change up that environment. But if you live in a house that's um, two bedrooms plus and you've got separate sort of designated areas, we want to try and find a place that's away from the kitchen and living area where there's less distraction, a place that's well lit and has good heating and cooling so that we're in a comfortable space. What equipment do we have available? This, so for me, I want to do a needs analysis with every one of my clients. What have you got at home that's personal? What's work provided for you? So if we've got a laptop or computer, do we have an ergonomic task chair or an adjustable chair? Or do we have a dining room chair? Do we have a desk or do we have a dining room table? Or do we have neither of those? Do we have other work areas in the house or potential work areas where we can actually switch things up and change things? So can you get to the kitchen table where it's standing height and do some tasks there standing with the laptop and doing Zoom call like we are today? Or can you get your ironing board out and put your laptop on, on that to out a stand? Can we get outside in our garden, plug your headphones in and do some work there and that sort of stuff? So we want to be thinking about all those key things as well as then your typical accessories such as keyboard, mouse, external monitor, etc. So we'll talk about that a bit more in detail soon. A good point to note here that certain businesses do have a level of responsibility, don't they, to be able to help support the working from home environment, whether it be providing some 
equipment or a better chair and a, a lot of our patients may not know that is, is yep. it is it reasonable to go to your boss and ask them and say hey i need a better chair to work from home or you know i mean i don't want to get to go down that work cover road but it, i mean yep. it's certainly front of mind for a lot of people and this has been going on for some time yeah as professionals are we able to, to suggest to our patients that they can start to have these conversations with the business owners Yep, definitely. So when I, when I think about things happening first in March, uh, most businesses would send people home, just get home, be safe, take your laptop. Um, and that was accommodated by everyone for probably six or eight weeks. Now that we've uh, sort of three or four months into this process and there's this discussion around return to work and many uh, businesses or organisations are sending out questionnaires and asking their workers, what can we learn from this? What have you liked about this? What have you not liked from this? Um, statistic, this is all anecdotal, but probably 90% of my workers and people we deal with are saying we want to work from home on a permanent basis two to three days a week and then be in the office. So if that becomes formalised, you as a worker or your workers or clients, therefore, are probably in a situation where they could probably ask the workplace for equipment to be able to set themselves up in an appropriate fashion if they're going to be performing the bulk of their work duties at home two to three days a week versus a temporary arrangement where you might say, I'm going to work from home because my, uh, my son's sick today. That, that sort of informal setup probably doesn't demand that type of change. So yes, to answer your question, have that discussion with your clients. And firstly, I'd be sort of just letting them know these are the questions that you might want to be asking. Who do you raise that with? HR, people and culture, OH&S rep, line manager. And then us as practitioners, how do we support that worker more? Can we put together some type of referral letter to, and again, they're coming to the clinic probably because they've got some musculoskeletal complaints. So there's probably a bigger need to actually have a better setup if there's some ergonomic drivers there that are aggravating their symptoms. So therefore, what can we do as practitioners to support them? That'll be writing a letter uh, to support that reasoning why and what type of outcome we're looking for. And one of the questions that we got earlier was, based upon our scope of practice. I mean, our health, our health and safety is a big field. We yep. are practitioners. Obviously, we've got a duty of care to look after our patients and get them in the right environment. But where are we crossing the line? And if you haven't done a course online, for example, one of your own or another one, we can obviously assess our patients and we can assist with their needs. But where are we overstepping the line? And are we going to get some health and safety teams from organizations turning around going well what does this physio know what does this osteopath know where where are our boundaries in this yep okay so let's keep it simple and i'm going to focus here on australia um, but obviously if we're talking physio osteo chiro ep um, office workstation ergonomics falls within that remit typically um, from one an insurance point of view but two from an undergraduate or postgraduate training there'll be elements within that that you're going to be learning at university obviously we want to work within our scope of practice of our, of our understanding so that might be if you've done four hours of study versus 30 hours there's going to be a difference um, but if we think in pure sort of simplistic uh, terms patient comes in they've got a musculoskeletal complaint You've identified through the case history and you might uh, assess, say, subjectively through or observationally through some videos or photos of that setup. We know that there'll be um, maybe some postural biomechanical factors at play there that might be driving it. And then we also know within our case history, what are some of those organisational cognitive biopsychosocial factors that are at play there? And so we might not necessarily be doing a risk assessment, but we can write a letter to support, um, one, the need to arrange for a risk assessment uh, that is more formalised within the OCH health and safety space for that to then identify some of those risks and hazards for then a control measure to be implemented. So people think often ergonomics as being equipment will solve all of those issues. It might not be equipment as the key control measure to change it. It might be more break behaviours, uh, get up and move around. How do we change how that person does their job? So yes, it does fall within our scope. And depending on what you've done, um, if you've gone off and done further stuff, uh, I suppose that might just enable you to potentially feel more confident and comfortable with actually going to someone's home or doing a virtual consultation that involves a bit, a bit more of an OHS type of risk assessment. If you don't have that, keep it simple, focus on biomechanics, what you observe, 
us as practitioners, what we're really good at is our observational skills, our case history skills, and we know that from those two key things there, that often will lead to, we generally know the answers to a lot of that stuff anyway, so that's gonna help drive um, some of our recommendations and discussions, and it might just open up a conversation within that business that was not being had before that now leads to a change that's positive for our client. So at the very least, if you aren't confident in doing your own assessment or providing your own advice, yep. you can be the trigger and the referral source for getting an internal assessment totally. of the specialist that they have. Okay, that's it's great to know. So for the you know, there's a lot of practitioners out there that are like, oh my gosh, I haven't got any experience in this, I don't necessarily want to say the same thing. But yep. our voice is certainly not an echo in this area, it's one that it is that takes totally. a a credibility and we can drive for change. Okay, yep. right. And you might find, and I won't ramble too much, but um, those businesses that have got a really good culture in this space are doing it automatically. Other businesses that maybe are not aware of what they need to do. So that conversation might drive a, uh, a discussion internally for them to say, actually, we need to think about this. And then there's others sometimes where there needs to be an element of fear, I suppose, which I don't like necessarily focusing on that, but that might drive change that's better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. All righty. So let's um, uh, excuse obviously the uh, the photos here and that sort of stuff, um, but I've just tried to give a, a representative sort of step-by-step uh, -step process that if you've got that individual that's working from home, dining room table, dining room chair, this would be that person early on in COVID and they were thinking, okay, I'm gonna probably work from home for maybe three or four weeks. This is the sort of setup here. And if you've got clients that are working from home a couple of hours each day, then let's look at step by step. Number one, it's as good as it can be. Dining room chair, non-adjustable laptop. How do we optimize that? Push the laptop away, that's about it. Number two, get yourself some cushions uh, or a rolled up towel, soften the seat pan, support the low back, get in close to the workstation. We've still got lots of, uh, issues going on with these it could potentially lead to aches and pains for that individual but we're looking to see if we can optimize the sitting posture if you sit there for three hours the big issue is the sitting for three hours it, 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 this stuff doesn't necessarily mean it's going to result in aches and pains developing but the longer you might spend there then the risk for that might go up number three most people have a keyboard and mouse at home so but if we can still use cushions on your chair Dock your keyboard and mouse into your laptop, push your laptop away so that we're softening the degree of neck angle and we separate ourselves from the laptop. And then number four, raise your laptop up. So we're trying to mimic what a person might have in the office based on what we've got. Um, if I've got individuals working with a laptop in isolation, my advice would be every 30 minutes have to take a five minute break. If you're doing more than two hours worth of work a day, collectively on the laptop, then we want to be pushing towards image four and looking to try and change things up there, preferably with a task. So I'd be focusing and educating your clients on this stuff if possible. And a lot of it's then going to come down to break behaviors, etc., to try and minimize our exposure to long periods of time in those awkward postures. So the task chair is a key thing. And so Again, um, we, we've done many, many sort of uh, sort of virtual home assessments and we're seeing a range of stuff um, presenting itself. Most people are probably popping out to your local uh, sort of generalist ergonomic store and just buying what they think is going to be great for them. If it's a big executive style chair with armrests that are fixed, they think, great, that's going to be super comfortable, but they haven't necessarily thought about, well, how does that fit me? And what's that gonna fit like within my house? So bigger is not always better when it comes to this stuff. Um, if you can, and if they've got a budget of two to $400 uh, Aussie dollars, you're probably gonna find yourself a pretty good chair. We wanna look for a three liter chair, chair that swivels, chair that goes up and down, a chair that seat pan can tilt. If you're lucky, a chair where the seat pan goes in and out, chair where the backrest can recline the upright and a chair where the backrest can go up and down. So they're the key things we're looking for. From an educational point of view, I'd probably um, have all your clients be focusing on, and I'm gonna just push this screen back here a little bit and just move myself back in this chair here. So a little bit like we are now here, um, if I'm doing a Zoom consultation with all of my clients, we're like this, I will ask them to back into their chair, measure what space do they have between the front of the chair and back of the cuff, 
the ideal scenario is two to four fingers gap. If there's no gap, the seat pan's too big, half their legs hanging off, they're now going to be taking a lot of their stress through their glutes. So, what do we do? If they have a dining room chair, get a tape measure, measure from here to uh, the back of the calf. If that's 50 centimetres, take two or three centimetres off that to give us an idea of what type of seat pan depth is going to suit that person. So something that's maybe 47 centimetres. So a short worker that's five foot two might be looking for a petite chair that's 37 to 40 centimetres. A larger worker might need one that's 50 centimetres. So we're helping them decide what type of seat pan is going to suit them. The next key thing we want to look for is, does the backrest go to mid shoulder height? And if not, measure from uh, the seat pan up to mid scap or have that individual do that or someone within their family do that. Measure it, if it says 50 centimetres, you can now guide that person on what type of backrest height they need. Last but not least, weight capacity. So this chair here has a 160 weight capacity. Many chairs have 110. So if you don't mind, ask your workers or clients, what weight are you, so that you can provide a recommendation on a chair that's going to fit them. So if us as practitioners are going to be talking about chairs, does it fit them in terms of seat pad, backrest height, and then weight capacity? Then can we look on online to find a chair that's going to fit, and then can they get into the store, if possible, actually then trial subjectively what So we're going to get that fit. When it comes to setup position though, and I'll just be really super quick with this, if we've got a good seat pan depth there, we're looking to play around with our seat pan base. Most workers or clients will like a flat seat pan base. Those that like a anterior tilt here, they might be chasing that if you've got some sort of uh, anterior hip issues that don't like too much degrees of hip flexion or where we're needing to get better back support. But nine times out of 10, we're looking for a flat seat pan. Next thing we're doing is backrest angle. So traditionally, when you look at the old ergonomic pictures, everything was sort of this 99-90 rule. We sort of moved a bit from that. Most research sort of indicates that sort of 90 often an engaged sitting position, so you're working hard to be there. So can you replace it back into that sort of 110, 120 degrees where the backrest can do most of the work for them? And then we're adjusting this to optimise that lumbar support. And then last but not least, once we've got seat pan, backrest, height and angle comfortable, we're now chasing height. And that's going to be driven by the height of their desk. So a normal desk is say seven centimetres. Can they bring their chair up so that their forearms are just above the desk? Where this gets sort of tricky is if they're on a dining room table, typically that's 80 centimetres. We're now working in a position where they might not necessarily be able to get their chair up to the best height because it doesn't go high enough. So we're less compromised working with a shrug position here. So there might be risk factors there that we can't control. We want to try and do as best as we can. But if they can get it to the right height, arms just above desk height, then checking if feet are flat on the ground. If they're not flat on the ground, well supported, that person needs a foot. So that's a, a three minute spiel on how to find the best fit for a person, and then go through that step by step process. And then it's about sitting close to the desk, making sure we sit back in here. People talk about this idea of what's the best posture. I don't mind if someone's doing this, this, here. It's more. Your best posture is your next posture. Move regularly. You can do perfectly like this all day, but we're still at risk of getting aches and pains because that risk factor of duration and not moving might be driving tension for that person. So just a few things to be mindful of. There's no such thing as the ideal. It's just what's what's good for them and how do we create variation moving around that. I think that's the key, isn't it? Repetition and sustained. Too yep. much of anything is a bad thing, really. Totally. And that's, that's where the education side of it comes from. You know, is it breaks every 20? You can't just, there's no blanket rule, is there? It's not take a break every 20 minutes, take a break every hour. Your patients have to listen to their body or is there a general rule for that sort of stuff that you recommend? Yep. So, uh, like, and again, it comes down to your patient's self-awareness and mindfulness and, and what they uh, sort of how they feel. If they're quite intuitive, um, they'll, they'll be moving regularly. But if they're someone who's like a, a AAA personality, gets in the zone, and it's like, I've just got to bang this out for three hours, and that's how they get, that's how their thought process goes. 
then you might need to have a strategy that actually interrupts that for them. So is that something that popped up on the screen that actually creates that break behavior change for them? Or can we anchor some movement or a stretch to some particular task that they do? If they catch their eye on something, does that drive a, an activity? Or every time they go to the toilet or, or get, uh, get some water, let's do some stretches there. We need to anchor stuff that, to sort of really look at um, behavior change, I think, a little bit. Pain's a big motivator, but most of us wait until we're in pain to, to, to create change. But at that point there, we're just dealing with symptoms. So if we think about, say, health and well-being, we really want to get into better practices. Um, and that goes beyond, say, taking breaks. It also means let's look at how we do our tasks. Why do I always do all my emails first thing in the morning um, and then go on to another task later? Is that just because that's um, my preference for it or is that actually the best way to operate for me and my body? And in this instance, it's certainly being more proactive than reactive. As you said, if you're waiting for somebody to actually get pain, you've waited too long. So setting up a series of routines or even like an alarm set on your phone. Yep, to totally. Let people get up and move around. And then so the practitioner's role not only in assessing this workplace, but then to be providing certain exercises and a, and a program of exercises to do throughout the day as well. Yep. That's a big part of what we will do. So it's not only just the physical setup, it's okay. So now that you've got this stuff, here's routines of stuff that we can do. And that's obviously based on their, what's what's the patient's preference. And so can we do stuff that preferentially suits them? Uh, and then if, if it's not their preference, then how do we get movement into their day that fits within things that one, they like to do, but two, um, they can see themselves doing that fits within the, the context of the day. There'll be some there where you have to drive change just through, um, some people just need to be told, but most of us um, we can work with quite well where they'll come up with a solution rather than us trying to be the expert forcing a solution on it. Um, I might flick back to the presentation though, so I'm just gonna flick back if that's all right, Jade. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. shut it down so you can see what you're doing. Uh, super, so I'm just gonna pull it up again and I'm in here. So armrest, so sorry, I haven't talked about that. Effectively, keep the armrest on your chair if uh, they're not impeding that person's ability to get in close to the desk. If, if the armrests are well-worn, they're probably hitting the edge of the desk. There's some research that indicates that switching your um, posture, being supported between by the desk, and then the armrest might be another way to create movement behaviour change there. So armrest can be good, but just make sure that maybe they purchase a chair or have a chair where armrest can be removed if needed. Um, I've just got uh, some pictures here. We're just going to keep it really simple in terms of this you sort of stuff. Interrupt. We can't see your screen right now. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. I'm just going to flick that up again. That was my bad. Share screen. And cool. And can we see it now? It's coming. Yep. Super. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to flick back. So keyboard and mouse, simple rules. We're looking for relatively neutral postures. So that's simple terms, arms here, not here, arms here, not here, when it comes to keyboard and mouse use. Um, ignore that picture there with the, the wrist rest, but typically nine times out of ten, um, most people will have some slight degree of extension when using the keyboard and mouse, and we can make do without a wrist rest. The idea of a wrist rest is it's there for a break, but what we see is that people get these wrist rests and just pivot off it. So now, now therefore, we're creating repetition and potential fatigue for other tissues if they just fixate off that when working. So I wouldn't recommend a wrist rest for everyone. Screens, really simple. Try and get the screen up to a height where your eye lines sort of fall in top third if we can and screen about arm's length away. These are very broad general terms um, because it's obviously individual specific and we haven't taken into consideration sort of the 2020 vision and that sort of stuff. But we're just trying to look for neutral neck positions. Um, in terms of screen position, single screen in front, dual screen, you'll see here on that image there, that person's well set up for someone who does 50-50 use um, and so, Depending on that use, and this comes down to your case history or job task analysis, if you use two screens, if they spend 80% on one, 20% on the other, have them sit in front of 80%, have 20% screen off. So that subjective case history is really important. It's going to help drive um, that setup and education around that.
What we want to be mindful of is to say every 20 minutes or 20 metres away for 20 seconds, eyes get fatigued and we often forget about this. And if you've got tired eyes working at a screen that's looking down at that all the time, people will creep and morph into these postures that might be driving musculoskeletal aches and pains. So that's where that eye break uh, and body break uh, is super important. If you've got a sit-stand desk, you've got two types. In, in simple terms, um, it's a sit-stand desk great. Yes, it can be great for some and it might be uh, not so great for others. So the idea of a sit-stand desk is literally to be able to do all the same tasks sitting and standing, and we want to just be moving between the two. And for some people, that might mean every half hour or hour they're switching between the two. If someone's got a musculoskeletal complaint that's aggravated by standing, then they're probably going to want a sitting workstation set up. For those that have a, a complaint that's aggravated by sitting, then a standing workstation might be suitable. Two considerations there. If you're going to be asking that person to get a sit-stand desk, measure from elbow to floor. If that's 120 centimetres, that person's sit-stand desk needs to go 115 to 120 centimetres high. So just make sure you recommend an appropriate one. In terms of what type of sit-stand desk you're going to recommend, this comes down to job tasks, what equipment they need on their desk. Best practice and making it easier is a full sit-stand desk like the top image there. But if we're going to get a retrofit one like the picture below, we want to understand what do they need to have there. So you can see there there's limited forearm support. There's not a great deal of space for um, paper documents. Fitting two screens on there can be a bit tricky. So we need to understand that we're going to recommend the right type of desk. And then we need to think about the manual side of it. So people think sit stand desk, great, you've got low back pain. Yet if you're leaning in over here with a lever, even though it's hydraulic, are we now actually creating another risk factor for them? So just think about pr what's practical for that person. I've talked about this already, but get up and move around, find different work areas, change in work um, environments can be key, can freshen people up a bit, get outside, try and move and that sort of stuff. So we don't want to be just blocked into one little work environment um, because that sort of might end up sort of leading to more tension developing throughout the day. I've put down a few movement break ideas. You're going to have micro breaks. So if you're in a call centre where you're doing lots of data in that person might need to have a 30 second break every five to seven minutes when they're working on the mouse just to give those little muscles there a bit of a break versus the person who's doing quite interactive screen viewing, typing and mouse work. They might just need to have breaks every sort of 30 minutes because the nature of their job is quite dynamic and always shifting and changing. We want to have a longer break um, as we're working longer. So every couple of hours I'm encouraging that. We want to take regular eye breaks. And if you have a person that's getting a sit stand desk, Start with incremental amounts of standing as we build up and gradually expose that person to standing so they can tolerate it. We don't want to get that person going from sitting to standing um, all day because that might drive more aches and pains. So I've just kept that really simple uh, in terms of some movement break ideas, just being mindful of time. Um, we talked about this before, Jade, uh, or you mentioned before. How do we go about requesting an assessment or some equipment? Um, I would keep it quite obviously based on um, firstly getting that patient's uh, sort of consent to writing a letter to then communicate with that key stakeholder within the workplace. But I'd get a sense of uh, worker's name, details, their current presenting complaint. Um, Billy has uh, you know mechanical low back pain. Uh, it's been present for this long. It's aggravated by these factors. It's relieved by this. Treatment and management's involved. Manual therapy active exercise interventions, they're taking lots of regular breaks. However, their history and uh, suggests that potentially their work environment and their equipment might be driving some of that. And the fact that 95% of their work involves them working at the workstation and sitting, the reasons we want to get a workstation assessment is because I think that the chair's contributing to that and their desk and monitor. So you want to sort of obviously be quite specific uh, in terms of that and highlight what they have been doing and what you think might be appropriate. Where your scope of practice might lie is, is that if you're not sure what they need, but you know that ergonomics is a factor, just request an ergonomic assessment. But if you've got a better understanding or have done some studies around stuff and you're thinking, okay, a standard mouse is driving sort of tennis elbow, rotator cuff pain, and I'd like a vertical mouse, 
uh, or a short keyboard, outline that you want a short keyboard and a vertical mouse so that we can try and put that upper limb in a more neutral position that's less likely to aggravate their symptoms. So go to the depth that you feel comfortable with and that could be all the way through to providing equipment links or just being very generic in terms of what the request is. Educating the client. Um, it's a day later, but there's a free poster that you guys can download um, and you can hand that out to everyone. Broadly covers all the key things that I've talked about uh, today, of which is going to be in today's webinar. And then obviously when it comes to the corporate client, so the workers business, um, we put together uh, a little bit of a, a PDF ebook here that outlines some of those key things that that business needs to consider. And that can be useful sometimes for our clients to read that they can then hand on to um, their uh, line manager or OHS or HR um, key person. Um, if you're looking for more information, I've put this here, but I won't um, uh, talk too much about this at the moment. But I thought, Jade, are there any questions coming through that we might want to discuss or talk about? I th it, this has been very comprehensive, and I'm sure that everyone's finding so much value in this. There's so much that you could cover. You certainly covered the basics and a lot of what. I think a lot of practitioners are, are, are conflicting with in regard to their scope of practice. So it's given yep. a lot of people love and knowledge, but I mean, you've got extended courses online. I, I've sent a huge number of my team through those courses. They're amazing. There's even a special deal on at the moment um, across a couple of courses in there. Yep. Yeah, so we've got, um, obviously, with the um, closure of obviously face-to-face -face events uh, and that sort of stuff, we've put our office ergonomics uh, three-hour PD course online and we've also put our um, vehicle ergonomics course online. So they can be um, purchased on those links within the webinar there that I've provided. Um, the key aim there is that it's really just to build on your current knowledge base, understand what does the current evidence show, and then for us as practitioners, how can we be get better outcomes for our clients, which one, makes us look good, but two, helps them in terms of their symptoms and that sort of stuff. So uh, typically both courses are $129 each, but if you buy both um, at the moment, if you use the coupon code uh, CWHA350 at the checkout, you'll get both courses for $129. Um, obviously, the goal of this is not to sell uh, lots of that stuff. I want you guys, though, to get best outcomes with your clients because um, essentially it might mean that we get to the root cause of what's going on rather than us just always maybe focusing on symptom modification treatments and that sort of stuff. So let's drive change at the core rather than just dealing with And we did have one question come in from Zen yep. in regards to advising of changing screens for light intensity and blue light filters. Oh, yeah. Do you have recommendations on that when it comes to eye fatigue? Yeah, um, so if you think, like, let's talk lighting very briefly. You've got two issues around light. You've got external light and internal light. If we're thinking, um, like, eye health and that sort of stuff, firstly, look at the screen and the brightness and contrast and see are we getting any glare or contrast issues there that could be driving eye strain. But then if we're thinking, say, UV light, um, uh, if you're wanting to look at that blue light thing, I think Flux is a good uh, app that you can download that will change that type of lighting through the day. And you can also buy uh, external UV, like sort of like a screen filter protector that you can put over your screen if, if that's of a concern. Um, to be honest with you, I don't focus too much on that because my understanding around the evidence is that it's a, it can be a bit mixed um, and that stuff. But obviously, uh, I haven't looked into that for a good sort of six months or so. I've only ever had one client who had a condition where um, UV light was, a, was a, a factor for their unique genetic disease uh, condition where we had to look at changing their exposure to light um, and that was more driven by external light than the overhead UV light, not necessarily the screen uh, and that sort of stuff. So if you're being proactive about it, you can look at some of those apps to download and for, and for people to uh, put on their computer and stuff. Great. Now, I know that you are really pressed for time because you are rushing off to go and lecture at the uni. But some of the students yep. uh, so we'll certainly let you go but we will add some of the links in the comments below that PDF that we had a chat about for those of you who've been watching all the way through or who've got to the end of this recording there is going to be CPD certificates available to download so that you can have these for your record to be able to pass them on to APRA 
So thank you for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much, Heath, for putting all of that together. So informative and we really appreciate and value your time. And we are very lucky to have you as a leader in this area. Thanks for having me, Jade. And uh, hopefully any of those that have watched it have got two or three key points out of today. No worries. And we'll shoot some people across to your link. You're also a GRX leader, so you're on the website. So anyone who wants to connect with you, we'll send you via there. And there's your LinkedIn and all of your website profiles and stuff on there as well. So thank you very much again. Excellent. Thanks, Great Jade. Bye, everyone. Bye.